it's been so wonderful to sit and also watch other people share their reflections. Um, and someone earlier was asking me if I feel nervous whenever I do this. And I, I realized I don't feel nervous because I, I see it as sharing something that's really important for me, something that I've learned. Uh, and it, if, if it doesn't resonate with you, it's a, you know, it's a shame, but it's also a useful learning that something I'm sharing here may not resonate with you, but it's, it's truth to me and it's important to me. So I'm really excited to share my reflections with you today. And I want to start with um, uh, an important reflection of what got me on this journey of volunteering uh, in the mental health sector. So uh, the journey started about six, seven years ago. Um, my partner at the time broke up with me and uh, that had been a relationship that meant a great deal to me. And it was something that I'd set uh, a version of the future, what the future looked like. I'd, I'd seen that person there and suddenly the future felt really blurry and I wasn't entirely sure what it looked like. So. It was, it was an emotionally challenging period. I had to sort of reframe a lot of things. I had to reshape my relationship with goal setting. And I was struggling. I wasn't entirely sure how to do that on my own. So I Googled, I saw what tools and resources are available for me. And I found this number. In the UK, we have a charity called Samaritans. It's a 24 seven mental health helpline. It started as a suicide helpline, but it manifested itself, it manifests itself these days as an emotional support helpline in any way you need emotional support. So I saw the number. I gave a call. I, was, I wasn't sure how to do it. Uh, I, was, I was a bit embarrassed that I needed to make that phone call. I felt like I had failed. I needed help. Um, and the volunteer was really wonderful. They gave me room to just pick myself up and to put things into words. They asked me really pointed questions, really helpful questions. They don't give advice. Um, and from that conversation, it was about an hour. It transformed my perspective. It helped me get on the path to reshape my goals. And I thought whenever I can, one day I want to train to do what that volunteer did with me. So about eight months later, I signed on to become a volunteer. I went through the interviews. I was successful. And I've learned some of the techniques that um, so that Samaritan used on the phone with me seven years ago. And it's been six years since I've been a volunteer Samaritan. And this is the listening wheel. This is something that you get exposed to when you go through Samaritan's training. At the center of it is silence. I always found that somewhat strange that a listening service at the center of it is silence. So the reason why silence is really meaningful uh, in the mental health service that we run is that it, it makes room for someone. And for most people, it can be really uncomfortable when you're being given space to just speak and no one's jumping in, no one's trying to get out of you. If you just want to collect your thoughts and figure out how to put these complex emotions into words, you have the silence for it. And there are a range of things in that wheel that um, are really useful in the service, but one of them I'm going to touch on today is reflection. And you'll see how reflection manifests itself in my practice and, and how I work through my own mental health as well. So that journey of becoming a volunteer also meant that I was able to support the branch in other ways. I started to help with a range of different initiatives in the branch to uh, help it keep going. It's a branch of 100 volunteers, so there's always a lot of work to do. And it meant that I was also able to help the charity and promote the service to other people who may need it. And uh, when it comes to suicide prevention specifically, men are the most at risk group in society and men of color especially are really at risk because it's mental health and emotional hardships are just not things that they talk about. So you see in this campaign that I'm about to share with you that I took part in, there's quite a bit of focus on men and getting them to talk. If the Samaritans weren't here as a charity and as a service and support, I probably won't be here talking about my story. I had a very bad Christmas period. I was suffering from extremely bad anxiety attacks. I couldn't see a way out of the really desperate situation I was in. My girlfriend of five years had uh, broken up with me. I felt a great sense of failure and uh, a great sense of disappointment in myself. I was bullied. Um, I was suffering with um, my mental health with depression. I remember coming home from work and I would just shut the curtains. I was um, really in a bad way and I just had to talk to someone. If somebody needs to talk to us about suicide, we're here to, to listen and to be there when you need us the most. So please don't suffer and don't go through it all on your own. i never forget the last volunteer that I had that conversation with. No judgment, but also giving me time to actually just talk. The person on the end of the phone, they care about you. They don't worry about what you're saying or judge what you're saying. 
anything can be said. And that's not something one necessarily even gets with close friends. I felt safe. I felt seen. After having that call with that Samaritan, I felt inspired to help others heal. It, it just drained away that feeling of helplessness. We'll never stop suicide if we can't break the silence. Samaritans rely on donations. Please donate to Samaritans this winter. Thank you for ensuring that the Samaritans are always here to listen. Together we can break the silence. An advert for Samaritans. Um, <laughs> but that story doesn't, uh, isn't entirely doom and gloom uh, from the perspective of what I went through. Uh, me and my partner got back together shortly after and we've been together for 13 years. So, <laughs> and she, she really gets annoyed that I tell this story when I'm on stage. <laughs> and she's like, not again. Um, but uh, uh, another facet of my life is uh, I'm also a lead product designer at a digital bank, Monzo. Uh, those of you who may not be familiar, Monzo is one of, I think, three UK digital banks. We don't have brick, brick and mortar branches. You can't go into the branch to print your statements. Uh, it's all on your app and some, some of it is on, on the web for business banking and a, ver a variety of other things that we, we do. Uh, Monzo's mission is to make money work for everyone. And that means being really mindful of how people interact with money. Our products are known for being really good with people with ADHD and people with various different experiences of, uh, of cognition and we deliberately design our products to be really accessible to use really simple human language and I've been really lucky to contribute to a range of things at Monzo that I'm proud of. Uh, I've worked on our payments experience. Uh, whenever you're paying someone in the app, I, I designed that with a great team of people. Whenever you're requesting money, so on and so forth. Everything that involves money moving around in the app, I, I've worked on in some way or another. Um, so that's a really another really demanding part of my life that I take a lot of energy from, it brings me a lot of joy, and it's a really important part of who I am. But there's this whole other facet, and there was a, uh, in one of the talks earlier, there was about asking yourself, who are you outside of work? And I realized that I'm also someone who really cares about mental health, well-being, and I saw that there was this whole other facet of my career developing as a volunteer. Um, when I started helping out more in the branch, people started to take notice. Our branch has 100 people. And every three years, people in the branch get asked, who do you think should be the next director? And if you're at the top of a number of people's list, they'll call you, they'll ask you if you're interested. And I was interested and I became the branch director. So uh, it's been a year and a half now since I've been leading our branch of 100 volunteers. This is a picture of me and uh, the CEO of a large company uh, trying to convince them to help, to give us some money to help keep us going as a branch. This is a, a, it's also our volunteers raising money at a station. And that journey of, of my life so far has been a really fascinating experience in also learning about human goodwill and how much people are willing to give just because they care about something. It's made me collaborate with people much older than me, people in their 80s, people from different industries, lawyers, that would have been slightly less likely to collaborate with uh, in my tech track of life. So it's been a really fulfilling journey. Um, and when I first got the call of asking me if I wanted to be the director, um, there's this checklist of things that you're kind of meant to read through and get a sense if you can actually go through that. You can do the things in that checklist and they're things like delegating work and uh, making sure you're setting strategy and so on and so forth. And I'd done some of those things before, hadn't done all of them, but I was willing to fail and I was willing to get it wrong and learn and, and get myself back up and keep going. So I said yes. But the reality is, but a lot of the things you're, you're doing and a lot of the things I've learned that you do as a leader, uh, in this case, as a director of a charity, um, the day-to-day -day version looks a little bit different. So from, I think, your, your left to right, uh, you, you can see a toilet paper order I had to place because we were running out of toilet paper in the brush. I was like, well, someone should really get new toilet paper. I was like, oh, I, I have to do that. I'm the director. We should get new toilet paper. So I had to place a toilet paper order, and then I realized some, the, the, the waste stopped being collected in our branch. So I had to call the waste collection services to set up. It was taking a while. It, they, were, they were not coming to collect, and I'll show you what ended up happening as a result. And we had health and safety checks where people come to the branch to make sure that the branch is well suited for anyone to volunteer and nothing bad can happen to them. And one of those checks is to make sure that the ladder you have in the branch isn't wobbly. 
And if the ladder is wobbly, then it's a risk for volunteers. So I had to go out and buy a non-wobbly ladder. So I'm just <laughs> there at the branch checking that the ladder is not wobbly. And I never thought this, these would be things that a director has to do. Um, but there are also really wholesome parts of it. I uh, set up a painting day at the branch where all the volunteers got together. Uh, volunteers have various different skill sets and trades. One of them is a decorator, so he brought all of his kit. Everyone got together, we painted the branch, had food, uh, and there's also a good sense of community. But that trash I spoke about earlier, it ended up being that they were taking so long to collect it that I, I took it upon my own hands. Uh, literally, I rented a car, covered the car with, with plastic to make sure to not uh, have any waste seep into the car, put all this waste into the car, drove it to the nearest tip, and, and threw it away. So this is the part of leadership that I, I wouldn't expect to find myself doing, to be the, the literal chief uh, waste officer. Um, and most of the times, I, I've learned the leadership isn't glamorous. The day-to-day -day of a lot of the things that you're doing, uh, sometimes you're just jumping in to get something done, um, and turns out that uh, trash stories aren't that popular at parties. <laughs> Um, not lots of people want to hear you talk about it. So um, there, are, there are loads of these moments where you step in and you sort of learn to find your own relationship with this thing that you have a lot of context of and you can't entirely share it with other people in your life, friends, family, other people in your team. And sometimes that can feel lonely. Uh, there are moments where you understand something and you would value talking to someone about it, but it's difficult to bring them all the way up to speed to the point that they can say something meaningful and help you. So I've learned through my own journey and some of the techniques I'm going to share with you how to find coping mechanisms and techniques that can help me keep going as a leader. And one thing that I found initially very difficult is that sometimes your absolute best with the best intentions isn't good enough. There's a specific example where one of our volunteers was going to go on caregiver leave. And I thought this volunteer has contributed so much to our branch. And they mentioned they wanted to continue to contribute uh, while on caregiver leave. And I said, that's absolutely fine, but my preference would be that you take a clean break because you've done so much. Uh, and if that's something you want to consider, just know that you shouldn't feel guilty for doing that. And by the way, uh, if you'd like, we'd like to send flowers when important occasions happen in people's lives. Are you okay with, with me doing that? And I was, I was really surprised that their response was, I can't believe you'd assume that I should be taking a break. I want to keep doing this, and I don't think you sending flowers is appropriate. And I was, I was mind blown. I couldn't understand how my message could be interpreted in that way. And fortunately, someone from the volunteer support team, which is basically our equivalent of HR, was also looped into the email and they messaged me, they're like, what was that? How was that interpreted in that way? But the reality is it's not always your fault. When people read what you write, when people hear what you say, when they see what you do, they're seeing it through their lens and they have histories and they have lived experiences that aren't always your fault. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take accountability as a leader and that doesn't mean you shouldn't meet them where they are and figure out how to work with them for a path forward. But it does mean that you shouldn't always blame yourself for something that you said or something that you did not being quite taken as you wanted it to, to be taken. And I've been watching Fallout, or actually finished watching it recently on Amazon Prime. Uh, sorry, Netflix. Um, <laughs> I highly recommend it. And there's this quote that really stayed with me, that everyone wants to stay, save the world. They just disagree on how. Uh, and oftentimes, people will think that what you're trying to do isn't with good intentions. And sometimes they'll try to jump in and, and stop you from doing that thing they think is, is, is bad. So on the techniques that I mentioned that help me get through, reflection has been a really important part. In many ways, this talk in itself is a form of reflection. But I also keep three different journals. Uh, it sounds like a lot, but I don't do it daily. Uh, I do it whenever it feels right. If there's something that's been on my mind, it feels largely relevant to my role as a director, I'll open up my director's journal and I'll type. Um, if there's something that feels very relevant to my life uh, and my feelings, then I'll open that journal and I'll document it. What makes it really helpful for me is I can look at themes over time. I can see I've been talking about this topic for quite a bit, or I can notice this thing is kind of no longer being as present as it once was. I feel like I'm getting over this thing. And what that's meant is that the reflections sometimes manifest themselves into strategy. I'll realize that I'm picking up something specific in my director's journal, and I'll share those reflections with my leadership team, and those reflections will then form the foundations of what ends up being our strategy documents. And in those reflections, I found it really important to pause and to pat myself on the back as well, because very often with that context that only you have, uh, you have to be realistic that not everyone will be able to see the great things that you're doing, 
and you have to pause and actually just think to yourself, is this a good thing? It feels like a good thing. I'm really proud of myself for that. And to really soak up the gratitude when you receive it. There will be people that are paying attention and the things they pay attention to, they want to tell you thank you for. And I think as a leader, and I've seen other leaders do this too, you have this long list of things that you want to do. And it can be really easy to gloss over the good thing that you did because you've got, you've got to get to the next thing. But actually just pause and soak up this really good thing that you've done, that someone's grateful for you having done it. And really soak it up. Don't just sort of look at it for a bit and appreciate it. Recognize that you, it took a lot of effort for you to do that. And someone saw it and someone really appreciates it. And when I think about anything that involves trying to achieve something important, um, whether you're doing it by yourself, whether you're doing it with a group of people, whether you're leading a team of people to do that. I think though the present will always matter, I think there needs to be room for framing the bigger picture. And sometimes the bigger picture uh, can help elevate people from the day to day. I found that sometimes when I first took on the director role, there were a lot of smaller things that people were paying a great deal of attention to. One of the things was, are we going to move branches? And everyone kept talking about whether we're going to move branches. People were panicking. Am I still going to be able to volunteer? And I helped very quickly move people away from that and help frame them as to what the longer picture of where we are as a branch and what we need to do to both keep being an operating branch and to be a successful part of the charity. And I started devising these strategies, these long-term pictures uh, that helped our leadership team get together, understand what, what actually working towards, what do other people need to do to help us get there. Uh, and to some of the points earlier, it then makes it easier for other people to know how to help you as a leader. Those strategy documents meant that it was really straightforward to have guardrails for success. Other volunteers knew if they're going to help with anything in the branch, they should help with this thing. And it also meant that people focus a lot less on the mundane things that made it difficult to be a volunteer in the branch. One of the things I find, find it really helpful to do as a leader as well, it takes the pressure off your shoulders a little bit when you shine the spotlight on other people doing really great work uh, in your team, in your organization. It means that people realize you're not doing it on your own. It means that people get the chance to see other leaders in action as well. People feel valued and recognized for what they do. And I think the life's happening every day. I think that no matter what you're doing, no matter how important it is for you to keep making progress, I think it's important that we all get the opportunity to savor the brief moment that we're all here on earth. Uh, I thought of replacing this slide with YOLO, but <laughs> it, it, it is a version of that. I think we should have moments to savor uh, everything that we're doing. And even if it doesn't feel perfect, um, it's, it's a wonder to be able to use your mind to something productive and creative that makes people's lives better in some way. And this is something I wish someone had told me earlier. Um, I, I care a great deal about people. Uh, I sometimes think I go too far. And I've had to learn that I'm, I'm no one's martyr. Uh, me sacrificing my mental health, my well-being, and going much further than I think is reasonable isn't a good thing for anyone. It's not a good thing for me. And it certainly doesn't set a good example for my team and other people around me. And if no one's going to say it to you this week, no one's ever said it to you before, I want to say thank you to the people in the room who are doing some form of leadership themselves and they're doing a great deal of things that aren't going noticed. And I want to say thank you for doing those things uh, even though they go by unnoticed. And I want to say thank you for listening to me today. <laughs>